Samuel 16, 14, we're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit operated in the Jewish age or the Old Covenant. <clears throat> because it's pretty obvious when you study the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament that it works completely different in the New Testament, that's for sure. And so we're going to we're going to identify some of those things. Um hopefully to just show what a privilege it is to live in the church age. Of all the dispensations that you can study, I mean, living in the church age is just, wow. I mean, it's so far out there. Uh, but anyhow, uh, here's 1 Samuel 16, 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord, that's a capital S, departed from Saul. Uh S-U-R is the Hebrew word depart. Um, Suzanne, do you have your King James? Yes. Did you, what does it say? Does it say depart or left? Mine says depart. Depart? Depart. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty standard. Mean, means to leave behind. It means to leave behind. It means to depart. I guess everybody would believe that and understand that's what depart is. Depart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it, it actually means more than it. it means to leave behind. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord departed, and it's a Cal perfect. That's a completed action um, in uh, the Hebrew. That's a Cal perfect. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. And there's a great principle here. One of the principles is, is that when the things of God, when you choose not to do, to put the things of God in priority of your life, there's a vacuum. And the devil fills that vacuum in your life. And... That, that the sense of a vacuum and, and the displacement in your life should be a clue of your carnality and maybe your reversionism. It ought, to, it ought to speak volumes, shouldn't it? Because the one thing you once cherished is no longer there and something else has taken its place. And, there, that, and you know where that void is and you know what, how you filled it. You fill that void in your life with things that are not spiritually um, good for you. They, they don't motivate you to God. They don't motivate you to prayer. They don't motivate, motivate you to tell other people about how wonderful this life is. And so the word depart and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him is kind of what's going to happen to Saul for the rest of his tour. Uh, and after a word of prayer, we're going to look at now that this, what happened to Saul could never happen to you as a believer in that the Holy Spirit cannot leave you. John 14, 16. John 14, 16. He is with you forever. He is with you forever. John 14, 16. He's with you forever. Well, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our evening study. It's a moment for you to do classroom etiquette. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Identity of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. At least that'd be three categories for you to, to test. And if carnality is there, then there is a, a quenching and grieving of the Holy Spirit in your soul. There is a, 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 an absence of his, of his presence importance in your life. And like for Saul, you're going to substitute other things in his place. And that's going to be fruitless in your life. Not going to be able to produce the fruit that you're familiar with in your life. And so what do you do? Well, 1 John 1.9 says you confess your sins. 
He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that cleansing is extended to your life from your salvation experience from Christ on the cross. This time, it's you're doing this not for salvation, but you're doing it for sanctification. So you confess your sin, and it brings you back into restorational life with, with God through Christ. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can study the Bible that way, and it's essential for Bible study, and it's essential for living the Bible out in your life. The Word of God, living your life by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. So I'm going to give you a moment through your priesthood, take that responsibility, and then we'll study tonight. Well, Father, we're thankful tonight for all the things your grace has provided provided for us to be here tonight to study this lesson, to see how privileged we are to have the dynamic, mighty power of the third person of the Godhead live within us permanently, has turned our corruptible house into a temple of God because of the grace of God, not because of anything we do, but because of the grace of God of what Christ has done for us. And now... God is able to walk among us in the person of the Holy Spirit for great ministry. And what a privilege that is. This was different in the Old Testament. And we'll talk about that tonight as we have been studying the life of Samuel. As the life of Samuel touches the, the life of the first king of Israel, Saul. So we'll resume our study tonight looking at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Jewish age. In Jesus' name, amen. In the Jewish age, the Holy Spirit could depart from you. God could say that you're, he's done with you. And this is not true in the church age. That, so you got a GA up there. You got a CA. The GA, of course, is Jewish age. And the CA is church age. Now, Jesus said in the upper room discourse that goes from 13 through 17, he said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Notice the word another is important. The word another, I wrote it on your paper, or I printed it, is alas, A-L-L-O-S. And it means another of the same kind. When he says, I'm going to, I've asked the Father to give you another comforter, another helper, um, another comforter, another helper. Uh, well, anyhow, it's the word Pericles. He's referring to div divine. In other words, another one like him. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The, the another comforter is going to be another uh, person of the Godhead. And Alas means that. Uh, and he, the Father, will give you another helper, a paracletos, a comforter, helper, exhorter. I don't know how your Bible might have translated it. That, with, with a purpose, Ina is looking for a subjunctive, uh, that he may be with you forever. When Jesus leaves this earth and the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to take up residence in every church age believer at the point of salvation. And he is not permitted by divine decree to leave you. It's not up to you. It's not up to you. And God has promised he'll never leave you. Once he enters, he'll never leave you. That's a big deal. And then he's identified as the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him. Watch this now. Because he abides with you. I'm in John 14. Christ is set on the earth. So what he's promising is not there yet. What the Holy Spirit is operating under in John 14 is Jewish age. When Christ leaves and goes back to the Father and Pentecost comes, which we call Acts 2, 
a whole new ball game with the ministry of the Holy Spirit starts. And that's what he's talking about. But you know him because he abides with, abides with you now, but then will be in you. See, there's a big difference. You ought to circle the word with and in because these prepositions are important. In the Jewish age, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, abide with you, with you. But in the church age, he abides in you. The word abide means to remain, to be re functional, remain functional. And of course, uh, we, he goes on, he, oh, that, that's all I wanted from it. And of course, what that results in is 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, don't you know that your body's the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in there. We call that the indwelling. He's a live-in resident um, because, verse 20 says, because you've been bought with a purchase. Your body has been bought. Your body, he says your body's not your own anymore. Christ bought your body. And that's kind of interesting. And wh what good is the body to the believer? It's a temporal housing. I mean, it's a life deal, but it's a temporal housing, right? We die and it goes back to the worms. The dust of the ground and the worms. <laughs> so we don't, we don't think that the body came from the worms. <laughs> it goes back to what it was come from, what was the earth, and then the worms. Uh, so that, that's kind of an important issue. Um, now, I want to look at five things. I give you an idea of the Old Testament. During the Jewish age, the Holy Spirit resided temporarily with certain believers, not all believers, only certain believers, for a specific task assigned by the Lord. In a moment, I'm going to give you seven examples, but there are many more, but I thought I'd give you a sampling, a sampling of them. Um, the Holy Spirit uh, did not reside with all believers in the Old Testament, like they do in the church age. Every, every person that believes in the gospel of Christ gets the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. That's recorded in Galatians 3, 2, and 3. That's where it tells you that. Um, and that's, I mean, w when the Jews would hear that, they would go like, that's crazy. Um, we do live in a unique age. Um, and the Holy Spirit could be removed at the end of an assignment. He, he, it could be a natural, a natural a coming for the assignment and a natural leaving when the assignment was over. I mean, um, that was interesting. In the case of Saul, though, it wasn't his task was over because he was king. He did it because he got in trouble with the Lord, didn't he? He got into carnality and reversionism, and the Lord, Lord said, listen, I have worked and worked and worked with you. I'm done working with you. The Holy Spirit's gone. You won't pay attention. That can't happen in our day. He disciplines us in a whole different way in the church age. In that day, he just removed the Holy Spirit. Uh, and they all knew when he did it. See, I think some, some believers in the church, don't, they haven't spent any time with him enough to know if he's there or not there. You go like, well, are you, all right, is the Holy Spirit, are you saved? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me something about how the Holy Spirit works in your life. And they'll go like, what? I don't know that the Holy Spirit work in my life. Oh, yeah. So I, I want to show you, I, I got seven samples or examples, seven samples of the way that I think are kind of interesting. For example, with Moses, the 70 elders that were assigned to Moses, you know, for the judgment and ruling the nation, he was overwhelmed. Who wouldn't have been overwhelmed? I mean, that's a big church, three million people. Um, so, uh, Numbers 11, 17 through 25, you might even, it might include 16 in that. And Isaiah 63, 10, 11. I, I liked Isaiah, you can read all these yourself, but Isaiah 63, 10, and 11. He, he shows you something about the Holy Spirit. So let's just go there a moment. Let's just go there a minute. Let me show you something 
uh, in the Hebrew, it's kind of interesting, in Isaiah, because uh, Isaiah mentions this and takes us back to Moses uh, in Isaiah. I, I got Isaiah now if I just get 6.3. Uh, here we are, 10 and 11. And, and he's talking about uh, the Israelites in the wilderness and under Moses. It says they rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? And grieved the Holy Spirit because they wouldn't listen to him. <laughs> grieved the whole, his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself. He, he turned himself to become their enemy and fought against them. Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought us up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Now, now here's a point I want to show you. Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them? That's how he worked in the Old Testament. In the midst of them. Now, show you something. If you went to the Hebrew Bible and looked this up, you would, you would find that there are three parts to this. And I tell you this because we have people studying Hebrew, and this is important. Uh, so I'm going to show you some things uh, of how this thing uh, looks. When it says, in the midst of them, it's one word in the Hebrew that has three parts. It has in the, in, uh, in the midst of them. In, uh, a preposition, in the midst of them. Now this word, midst, is this word. Right there. And so when you look in the Hebrew Bible, it looks like it's just one great big word, you know, reading from the right to the left. But you have a preposition on the front of it. And those in Hebrew, you see those two dots, the, the shawad or that shows you that's a he Also, it's translated in. And then you've got this word right here. And then you have the them on, the, on it. Okay? Now, when you look up this word, that's what you do when you do that. You look up this word. You look up the root of it. And it, that's where you get uh, midst, in the midst, all right, in the midst of them. And so we would never talk that way in the church age, but that's the way they talked about it in the Jewish age. The Holy Spirit was in their midst doing things. Now, often you hear people talk this way in the church age because they don't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They want the Holy Spirit to come in their midst and do stuff and do all that. That's Old Testament thinking. The Holy Spirit is already in your midst if you have a gathering. Holy Spirit resides in you. And the dynamics of his ministry is flowing out of you. See, that's, it. that's John. Look, go to your Bibles. This is John 7. Here's how it works, and, and Jesus told us, here's how it's going to work in the age of Messiah, in our age, which we call the church age now. In John, the seventh chapter, I'm in Romans. I, I want John. Don't, you go to John 7. I just went the wrong place. John 7. I didn't realize until I got there, and I didn't have no 37. Uh, I'm in John 737 through 39, it says, on that last day, he's at, on the feast day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now watch how he explains it. Had he not explained it, we would have been crazy to try to figure this out. Because this is not the way it worked in the Old Testament. He says, but he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified, meaning die on a cross, be buried, raised from the dead and sent back to the father. 
seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. But when that occurred, then the Holy Spirit would come and a new day would be issued in, in which the Holy Spirit would take up residence inside a believer and the ministry would flow from that person. You see, see how important the devil's ministry, uh, work is to shut down that ministry. How does he shut down the ministry today in the church? Shut down the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is everything. It's the power to prayer. It's, it's the power. It's the whole power grid, as they say. And if he can get you in carnality and keep you in carnality, then he's got you. He shut down your power grid. You know, that's one of the things in all this discussion about Russia this and Russia that, people hacking in. The biggest fear they have in people being a hack, hack into our system is shutting down our grid. And, and, um, and so this is, this is a great passage here. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being, from his, inner, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It flows from us. We're not looking for, from the Holy Spirit is out here somewhere doing stuff. It's in us doing something out there. And look, here's what's interesting. I don't know how many people we got here. Let's, I, I did 30 some things. So let's say we got near, th near, nearly 30 people here tonight. The Holy Spirit, the same identical Holy Spirit as every one of us. Think about that. Now, each of us have different personalities. Yada, yada, yada. Same personality of the Holy Spirit in every one of us. Same fruit of the Holy Spirit in every one of us. Same power of the Holy Spirit in every one of us. Well, we are different people, for sure, by personality, by backgrounds, by education, by social conduct, by a whole lot of different things. We are united in one thing, and that is, as spiritual people, we are, the, we are identified alike. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? You couldn't do that. Look, you couldn't do that politically. You couldn't do it. You can't even do it on ball teams. You can't do it anywhere. I mean, this is the most amazing thing in the whole wide world. And the devil understands that. He shuts that whole system down by carnality. Now, he can't remove it, but he can shut it down. He can shut down that ministry flowing out. That's pretty, pr pretty amazing. But anyhow, the 70, the 70 elders that were to assist Moses had it for that, for that reason. Joshua... In, in Numbers 27, 18 and Deuteronomy 34, 9, which you can read, Joshua leading the second generation of the Exodus, he had it. That, that was to equip him to do that work. Um, Joseph had it for preserving the nation. And you know what's interesting to me is how everybody, the, the father doesn't talk so much about how the Holy Spirit worked with Joseph. Do you know what's interesting about Joseph? Well, he did. Everybody he worked with saw it. Everybody, everywhere he went, they saw it. They saw the Spirit of God working from his life to other people. And they all saw it. They, they all recognized. He, they called it a divine spirit. Pharaoh, in the passage I gave you, Pharaoh identifies that way. Uh, 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 everybody did. The jailer did. I mean, everybody. I just picked the big guy out. If I get on quote somebody, I might as well quote the, quote the head guy. <laughs> judges, all the judges. Uh, Gideon, in the sixth chapter, verse 34, the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. You know, the judge, and it was, it was whenever, it wasn't on him because he was a judge. It was on him in any assignment he was given as a judge to do something for the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And then when that task was over and he went back to farming or whatever he did, that was done. And when he was called again, pfft, Spirit of God went on him to do that. And, and one of the real interesting studies of the, of the judges and, and it really is an interesting. It's probably for the average person, it's a little boring. But 
because the judge says, yeah, here comes the judge business. But, <laughs> but the interesting thing about the whole thing is watch how God works with each one who has a different character and different thing and how he works with it. And that's a key. That's a, one of the things you see consistently uh, about that. that. So for me, that's interesting. I picked Gideon because I know everybody knows Gideon. And we have one of his followers come every year and talk about their ministry. So I picked the Gideons. Um, kings, we're studying that. We saw Saul. And now we see King, uh, David. David's going to have the same thing. The king's assignment. Prophets, Daniel 4.8. Um, I, like, I like Peter's concept. In 2 Peter uh, 1.20 and 21, he talks about the prophets of the old covenant. And, and, and he says there's a commonality within it in this way. And, and he refers to them in the Old Testament. It said, prophets moved by, by, uh, moved by uh, his spirit spoke uh, from God. Something of that nature. Um, th that's interesting. Moved. And, and, and so prophets of the Old Testament, when they were called to do specific things, could do that. Um, in fact, one of the interesting things, I think, you remember when Saul, uh, when God gave him the Holy Spirit? Remember when he gave it to Saul? You know what he did? It, to, to manifest the Holy Spirit from his life that he had been anointed by God to the king, he put him out with the prophets and he prophesied. I mean, in the Old Testament, the evidence of the Holy Spirit was first to you to know that you that God had changed your heart to do the things for God. And the other was to make it to do something that made it visible to other people that God had his hand upon your life. That there was an anointing. Now, that anointing should be upon every one of us. Right? I mean, John in the in his writings in First John talk about it. Uh, Acts 25, uh, 28 talks about Isaiah, uh, the prophet Isaiah and the spirit of God speaking uh, the things of God. Um, everybody connected with the building of the temple or, or the tabernacle. Uh, by that, I mean the ones God built and not the ones man built. I'm not talking about Herod. <clears throat> But Exodus 28, 3, um, Exodus 31, 2, 2 through 21, I mean, that's a long look at it. I mean, he, he, would, he, would, pick, he would pick expert craftsmen, and then he would anoint them to do beyond and above their capacity. He'd pick the best. And then he would take the best and lift them, lift them right out of their skin to do things amazing. We, we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us every day. This, this is no different Holy Spirit. So, point number two. The Holy Spirit was given to Saul and to David at the beginning of the reign as king not at the point of their salvation. They didn't get the Holy Spirit they got saved. They didn't get the Holy Now you get the Holy Spirit when you get saved. They didn't get it because they got saved. They got it when they were were appointed a specific task. Um, first Samuel, a, a, a great passage to look at is first Samuel 10, 6 through uh, 12. Uh, let's go there for a moment. Uh, let me show you uh, some things that was true then, and they're true. They're, they're, they're truisms about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. About about what? About the Holy Spirit never changes because the dispensation does, but His ministry does. So, I'm in the tenth chapter, and I'm looking at verse six. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily. And that is, 
when you, when you get an, uh, anointed and get into your ministry, Saul, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be, look at that, and be changed into another man. The Holy Spirit's ministry, and this was true in the Old Testament, it's true in the New Testament. And we, and we have more terms about it in the New Testament. We talk about being, when you talk about the seven works of the Holy Spirit and salvation under the New Covenant, you're going to find you got to be born again. You got the over the power of the Holy Spirit, all that stuff. But look at look at verse look, look at verse six when he says, "And be changed into another man." That word "changed." I'm put another Hebrew word up there. Put another Hebrew word up there is because listen, I can put these words up here because. There's a large majority, that's a K on the end. There's a large majority of my people understand this. They understand it. So I'm privileged to be able to use that. If I was someplace else, I wouldn't. That's a H-A-P-H-A-K. That's what the word is. Uh, to change. This is the word to change. And, and in uh, this one, in this verse, verse 6, it's a nifel passive perfect. It's nifel. And it's passive. It's, a, it's passive. And that's why we'll be changed, be changed into another man. Be changed. That change is not going to come from within inside him as he makes decisions in his life. It's going to come from the Holy Spirit come upon him, coming upon him mightily and changing him. Now, he can make choices about what, what he wants to do with it, which he did, and the Holy Spirit got withdrew from him. With us, when we do that, we, we fall into carnality and have to be restored. But we're just, we're, we're talking about it right now. Um, look it down in verse 9 for a minute, because then he gives them an assignment. Uh, 7 uh, talks about signs and and what he, where he's going to go. And then verse 9. Then it happened when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God changed his heart. And all those signs came about on that day. Now, who are the signs for? Well, we know Hebrews. You know, 1 Corinthians one twenty two. Hebrews need sign. Greeks need wisdom. One sign is the sign of the, 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 pre, the sign of, of the presence of the power of God in his life to do the things that God has assigned him. Whatever the directive will of God assigns to him, he now has the mighty power of the presence of God. See, Moses understood that when he went into Egypt. Without that, he could have done it. He, he told him before he, ever, before he ever left the wilderness, I can't do that. <laughs> So he, he, he gave him the stick drill. Throw the stick down, pick it up, you know, all that. He gave him a stick drill to teach him that it's not about you. I can take any old stick. And, and he certainly does, doesn't he? Well, you will be changed. Now in verse 9, then it happened when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God changed his heart. God did. How did he do that? Ministry of the Holy Spirit. We know that. Listen, and what was it? Listen, listen, it is so important. You know what he was before the Spirit of God came upon him? As a believer, you know what he, you know what he was? He was a farmer. I mean, he spent his days looking for lost donkeys. He was a farmer. Nothing wrong with that, but that's, that, that was his heart. He had a heart for farming. God changed his heart to be a king. Listen, God does that to you. You were this. Now you're saved. He wants you to be this. Listen, do you know what he wants you to be? No, I, I, I mean, do you know what he wants you to be? 
mean, how long is it going to take you with your feet on earth since your salvation to figure out what is it? I mean, many of us are still hunting donkeys when we ought to be reigning as kings. We're still hunting donkeys. We're still living that old life of something where there's not been this transformation. Listen, what do you think? Listen, for us changing our heart, we, that's Romans 12 too. That's 12 too in our, in our dispensation. Now, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your... And that's the changing of your heart. It's the changing of the guard. It's the changing of the guard of your life. And when we read, oh boy, he changed his heart, we think, wouldn't that be good if that could have that? What are you talking about? We, we have the same thing. We call it transformation, and it's a daily deal. Renewing your hearts daily. See, that's that 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 business. That's at, that's at Ephesians 4, 24 business. That's at Romans 12, 2 business. For David, when he was anointed, on your paper there, not anointed on your paper, but written, in the midst of, standing in the midst of his brothers, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. Just like he did who? Saul. See, that's what he did. And it, it, the mightily part was like, woo, for you. And for others, like, what just happened? And listen, he doesn't come upon us mightily. What does he do? Come out of us mightily. This is the same Holy Spirit. It's not a different guy. doesn't come upon us mightily. He comes out of us mightily. We have dunamis power. And it says, it came, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward, and that's the way it worked in the Old Testament. Point three. In the Jewish age, the Holy Spirit resided alongside some believers but not all believers. He had to be assigned some special task. It was not like the indwelling of all believers in the church age. For example, we have seen through the two kings, because that's our special study, that the Spirit of the Lord would come mightily upon them and they would prophesy or do whatever the Lord wanted them to do. And, and God would change their hearts for that mission. And sometimes he had to change it really a lot because, listen, De, uh, uh, Saul, a farmer. Uh, David, I guess you could call of him a farmer. He was a shepherd. Uh, rancher, maybe. I don't know what, what you do with all that stuff. But, and listen, he calls him. He, they weren't raised to be that way. He called them that way and he changed their heart to do it. Listen. You're probably not getting it and that, that's not your fault, it's mine. But listen, he saved you and has called you into that new man in Christ. And there ought to be evidence of it. And where our greatest disappointments in our life today as Christians are, is, is a failure trail. We spend too much time paying attention to the trailer failure trail. Well, geez, you know, I, I was doing pretty good, then I fell. Then I was doing pretty good, then I, I failed. Then I was doing pretty good, then I failed. I was doing pretty good, then I failed. Then I was doing pretty good, then I failed. And after a while, we get caught up in the failure part of it and, and kind of throw up our hands. And the father has never thrown up his hands. Not one time has he thrown up his hands. He might have thrown up, but he didn't throw up his hands. Right? He hasn't thrown up his hands. 
but, but now, but you have. And listen, he's still there. The Holy Spirit has gone to place. Still, still on his mission. Still on his mission. He wants to change your heart for Christ. He still wants to do that. There's people around you that need to see that, that you influence. They're waiting for that person to look different than they are, to give them some hope that transformation is the real deal. You got to quit looking behind and you got to start looking ahead to what Christ wants in your life. He wants the new man in Christ. He wants that new man. He wants that person he saves you to be. Come. And listen, stop looking back and stop looking in the rear view mirror and say, well, I've, I've, failed, I've failed, I've failed, I've failed. Listen, so what? Give it up. Confess it. Let it go as far as the east from the west. Rip that rear view mirror off. Stop looking behind you and start looking ahead of you to what God wants you to be. None of that's changed. The only thing that's changed in that has been you. None of this other has changed. God's heart still there. He's still, he's still excited about you as much as the day he saved you. He still excited you about you as much as the day he held you as a newborn babe in his arms. He has never left loving you. He loves you in the most unique way. Why would you give up when God hasn't give up? Why would you give up in yourself when God hasn't? And why would you find who that person God wants to be? Just asking. I, mean, I don't have an answer for it. I just have an answer for it in my own life, and that's about the best I can do. Um, when Je Jesus said something interesting to the disciples in John 14, 17, he says to his disciples in this upper room, 16, where he said the Holy Spirit will come, upon, come in, will be in you and will be there forever. In 17, he said that when this, this is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. That's the power of verse 17. That is the power of it. 16, 16 and 17, there's the power of it. That's the power of it. He is, look, gee whiz, just confess your sin and get back with the program. How easy is that? You know why it's easy for you? Because all the work was done by Christ on the cross. You confess your sins because they've already been cleansed. The blood already took care of them. But listen, you're paying too much attention to the world who don't give a rip about your spiritual life. They could care less. Get carnal and get down with me. That's the way the world thinks. Look, put your Bible in the trunk. Fluff up your hair. And get down and dirty. That's the way the world thinks. You can't think that way. Listen, they need Christ. They need somebody to stand up and say, look, you need a bath. You need to get bathed in Christ. Well, anyhow, four. When the Lord rejected Saul as king of Israel, the Holy Spirit was removed from Saul. But it was not a loss of salvation. Listen to me now. In the Old Testament, it was a loss of selective service. Selective service. Uh, Rick, do they still call that in the army that way? Selective service. Yeah, selective. Yeah. I, I remember seeing that a lot when I was in the military. They would talk about selective service. I didn't stay around it long enough to figure out what they meant by it. But, uh, but when I saw that, when I saw that, that made me think of that, that very idea. He didn't lose his salvation. He lost his, 
his selective service. He lost the mighty power to serve as a king. You see? To rule the people with the heart of God. I mean, that's, that's how God wants all of us to live. He wants you to live that way as a pastor. Listen, when you fail, you get back up on your feet, push forward and try to become that man. Listen. It was easy to be a teacher. It was hard to be a pastor. It was easy to teach. It was hard to pastor. Because you have to have to, you have to have, you have to have more than a gift. You have to have the heart of God. And sometimes they're, they're not the same thing. It's been true in my life. And at some point you got to, you can't keep looking back and say, failure, failure, failure. At some point, you have to go like, look, I'm going to confess that to you before God, and I'm going to push forward and become the person you've called me to be. And I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that. I'm not, try, try, not, not to hang around and waller in it, though. You, but you can easily waller in it. Not sit around and waller in it. Get back on your feet and get into transformation. Let God transform your heart. At some point, people will see it. They'll accept it. And if they won't, I can't do anything about that. But it's easy to teach because it's a gift. It's hard to pastor because it requires a changed heart. And uh, so I, I say that to you. There's a person. It's, it's, you got a gift, but listen, he wants the person behind the gift. To have the heart of God. And that's what I've learned over the years. That's, that's what I've learned. And, and at least for me, it was, a great, it was a great lesson. It was a hard lesson. You have to swallow a lot of pride to get rid of an old heart and get a new one. You have to give up a whole lot of pride. Which is a good thing in hindsight. But it's, it's, it's pulling wisdom tooth in the present. Um, during the Jew Jewish age, the Holy Spirit could be removed from a spiritual mature believer for failure, in Saul's case, for, for failure to obey the details of the directive will of God. You remember the story in 1 Corinthians, I mean, 1 Samuel 15. He did not, he went out and fought the war, but he didn't do what he told him to do. And, uh, and, and it was a pattern of behavior with him, with God, that got him in trouble. Uh, when David got into this, the greatest thing David feared is that God would do the same thing to him that he did to Saul and remove the Holy Spirit. And he knew there was no way he could reign without it. Listen, the great secret of spiritual growth maturity in the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to realize that he is the real deal and he's the deal that has to be there all the time. And this inner dialogue that you have with yourself all the time, pay attention to who you're talking to because you should be talking to the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you're always talking to yourself about, oh, yeah, 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 yeah you're not in a good place. And, and, and you need to have heart surgery. That's one of the ways you know it, but... But David, David was, in Psalms 51, David was fearful that the Lord would do that. And he knew, boy, I, I am, I'm a fish out of water without the Holy Spirit. And listen, we ought to realize that. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, we're fish out of water in this world. Um, I mean, the Lord tries to tell us many ways, tries to tell us, and we don't pay attention, but he tries to tell us, well, you know, you're not a citizen of this world. Don't be conformed to this world. This is a temporary place. You're just passing through here. This is your place of ministry. And we think it's our, our home. This is temporary. That's why it's, it's very difficult to get people to leave their comfort zones to go to the mission field. It, it amazes me. I mean, I'm one of those guys. I don't even like to go visit them. I mean, I really am a comfort guy. But it amazes me when young guys and, and, and gals are just 
pull up and just have a heart for God and just go to another nation, don't know the culture, don't know the language, don't know where they're going. They're Abraham going to a foreign land. just amazes me. But I know that that's a ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I know that. But that, that amazes me, and it witnesses greatly to me. It witnesses greatly to me. Do you have that heart for God? Stay in here? What do you do? I mean, you're sitting on your laurels. You're sitting in your comfort zone. Are you as active and participant in your home field? I don't know. Those are questions I have to, you know, those are the things the Holy Spirit makes me search my heart about. I mean, you know, Mr. Farmer, if you were to drive down the street with him, he'd be looking over here and looking over there right now. And, and then he'd go like, can we meet next Thursday for breakfast again? I'd say, yeah. But he, it's something special. They said, well, I'll tell you at breakfast. And so all those places he rode down, that little place over here, drive down straight, he saw that place, he saw that place, he saw that place. That's where we went the next, next week that we went and visited all of them. And he figured out, looking for doors of opportunity, kind of like Calvin did, looking for doors of opportunity. Uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he had every kind of imagination. In that one week, he came up with more ideas of how, what he could do. I remember we drove past this YMCA over here that opened up. He said, and I saw him write down. See, after a while, you learn that. But then I saw him write that down. Uh, uh, here we go. And sure enough, that we, sure enough, that's where we went. And I don't know how many years we stayed down there. Stayed there a long time. And did a lot of ministries. I saw him one time. He, he wrote down a, a, a name. Uh, and uh, it was, um, you know, these signs out where they, they give you plaques when your yard looks good or something. Yeah. And there's a group, of, a, a ladies group that does that stuff. What's that called? Garden. Well, that's what the sign says. But it's, a, it's like a garden club. Yeah. Well, he writes that down there. And the next week, he says, hey, I've called. Do you know how many garden, when I, there's another name for it. Do you know how many garden clubs there are in Birmingham? I said, no. He says, 30. I went, there, there are 30 garden clubs? He said, yeah. You know, Mr. Farmer loved uh, herbs. Uh, herbs, herbs. I don't know about herbs, but he, <laughs> he liked herbs. And um, he said, I've been thinking, Ron, about this. I want you to pray with me. I got 30. I need one to get into, and then I'll get the rest of them. I just need one door in, and I'm going to get them all. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm, I'm going to talk about herbs out of the Garden of Eden, because that's where herbs come from. And I, I you know, I thought, I, okay. Uh, he said, so here's a list. I want you to pray about it. I, I got to find one of them. And He goes to a grocery store. I, I know this, but he goes to a grocery store over, over where they lived in Cressway, like a, a food world. He talks to the manager in there. The first thing you know, he's selling herbs in that store. And the reason he's, in, the reason he, I said, well, wh why are you doing this? He said, I'm looking for that flower. He said, there are a bunch of ladies. There are several, there are several of these that are in this area of Brookwood. In that Brookwood that's attached, what, what is that? Crestwood. Well, what's connected to Crestwood that's big time? Mountain Brook. Uh, no, he, Mountain Brook. It wasn't after Crestwood. He was after Mountain Brook. There's several in Mountain Brook. And he said, I'm going to find one of them to let me in there. I've got this, and I'm setting up this little shop here, and I'm going to find me. And I swan if you didn't. And, and, and there he went all over the city telling them a little story, giving them the gospel. And he was in all kinds of He was in Jewish ones. He was in you name it. See, that's what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to tell you today, you know what that is? That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit working in the heart of somebody mightily who is trying to find, who is trying to find his identity in ministry from that. And... I mean, can we not learn anything from that? I mean, oh, well, you say that was unique for Mr. Farmer. He was unique. No, he was a spirit-filled guy with a heart for God. 
That's all that was. That's all that was. It, it's the same for all of us. It's, it's just a level of commitment. Just a level of commitment. It's just a level of desire to, to walk that walk for Christ in this life. I mean, think about all the opportunities that we drive by every day. If we just stopped and prayed about it and went in and said, hey, you got anybody in here that I get, you know, yada, yada? I mean, he did it all the time for all kinds of things. He just because he wanted to share the gospel. Point six. The Holy Spirit. Huh? Five was Mr. Farmer. <laughs> and, and I'm going to close this down because you can read this. But I, I, I want to show you kind of something unique in that when you look at the four dispensations, if you look at the Gentile age, the Jewish age, the church age, and the millennial age, you'll find the ministry of the Holy Spirit working uniquely different. For example, in the Gentile age, the Bible says he strived with man. In Genesis 6. In the, and I wrote some things. I gave you the Hebrew words. The Hebrew word is din. And I gave you the Greek word in the lexicon. Uh, in the, uh, the Septuagint. Uh, uh, in the Jewish age, he dwelt alongside. In the church age, he dwells inside. And on the millennial age, he'll be poured out upon. Acts 2. Well, I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. How do I know what that means? Well, that's, that's, that's not the word. I don't know. Is this going to pour upon you? And he'll tell you what he'll do now. If you read Acts 2, it comes out of Joel. He'll tell you what, what the effect it will have. But I don't know. I don't know what that. Mm -hmm. It seems like God is always gives us everything we need, whatever dispensation we're in. Right. Right. I mean, the Jewish age, is it because of the law that they didn't meet? Because they lived by the law? Is that why they didn't mm, I, the I, right See, I don't know why the, whole, the divine scheme of how the Holy Spirit works in different dispensation is way beyond my pay grade, as they say. I don't know. I just know he's got words, and I can tell you what the words mean, and then we can see how it works. For example, the, the striving with mankind, the only guy that comes out of there... Well, the two guys that come out of that period of the, the Gentile age is, is uh, Enoch, who was a prophet, and, and Noah. These two guys, you get a look at what it means to strive with man. Um, uh, we, we get a bigger look at um, the Jewish age, and we've certainly got the, the because we're living in the church age. In the millennial age, I don't know, but I do know that Acts 2 is talking about that. Because that's a prophecy of Joel. Uh, but, you know, you ask me what that is, I have no, I have no idea. I just know it means, he just says he's going to pour, pour him out, and this is what they're going to do. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be mightily. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe, maybe you could pray for me, and maybe the Lord will show me what that means, because I honestly haven't been really interested in looking in great detail. Uh, I'm just trying to get everybody to live in my dispensation. Uh, yeah. This afternoon, I was out, and I always listen to people that I learned from. Right. I try to learn from that all the time, cast out the money, and so forth. So I stopped to get something that was so hot out. I stopped to get something. I sat down in a place, and I said, oh, it's raining. And I saw this lady walk by the window. Yeah. And outside. Yeah. <laughs> just automatically, my eyes closed. Yeah. And she went on. Yeah. Yeah. Then I saw her come back. Yeah. The Spirit told me to go witness to her. I didn't know yeah. where she went. Yeah. And I, I said, I want to witness to her. When I finished, I got up and walked out. And then she yeah. goes, took me across the street. Yes. Under a tree. Yeah. So I went over there. Yeah. I took my card out with my name and everything yeah. on it. Well, I got a surprise. Yeah. Because as I began to talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was it a fig tree? 
You, it might have been Nathaniel in drag. Who knows? That, that could be what it was. We didn't know it. Well, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Get out of here. Father, we're so, we're so thankful for your love and mercy and grace. Thankful for each person that's come our way to study with us tonight. And although we've bounced all over the place, we've tried to make a point. And the point is to our dispensational work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We are such a privileged people. I hope that we would understand the dynamics of the importance of the third member of the Godhead residing within us. And how powerful that idea is. And it's not just for us. While it is to us, it's also through us. That he might show his mighty, powerful work in our life as well as outside of our life and on behalf of others. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.